All right, welcome back everybody. Today we're gonna to be brewing a style that I don't really see very frequently in the United States, and that is a Best Bitter. Uh, the English type of beer that is very common in the pubs out there. Uh, low ABV, high drinkability, really, really good flavor, and extremely unique kind of beer. So with British bitters, there are several different kinds. Uh, so I think the most common one, or the one that we see the most frequently, at least on this side of the pond, is uh, the ESB, or the Extra Special Bitter. Uh, but there's actually three different kinds of them. So typically the strongest one is the ESB, and we see that the most frequently. It's the five to 6% ABV version of a bitter. Uh, it's a little darker than the rest of them, typically kind of copper colored. And then we're gonna go step down the rung one level, and that's gonna be the best bitter, uh, which is what I'm brewing today. And that's a slightly weaker, slightly lighter colored version of an ESB. And then you step down one more level and you get to your standard or ordinary bitter, which is actually typically less than 4% ABV. Very sessionable beer, very light, uh, extremely drinkable. You know, with English pub culture, you wanna to go to the pub and you wanna have several pints and still be able to go home. And that's kind of the idea of such a sessionable beer. It's still packed full of flavor and it's something that English brewers are able to do extraordinarily well is take a beer that is very light and very uh, low ABV and just put so much interesting flavors into it. Um, and I don't think English beers really get as much love as they deserve, so I'm going to be focusing on them for, I think, most of this year and try to do as many English beers as I can. Um, but today we're starting out with the best bitter, and it should just be a great all-around beer uh, and really nice, easy drinker, and uh, hopefully um, it is something that I can be proud of. So I've never brewed this style ever before, so I'm kind of taking my first attempt at it here today. Uh, and we'll do the best we can. So it should be a relatively easy beer to pull off. Uh, so long as we don't go overboard on the hopping rates, which I don't think we will. So anyway, on a quick tangent, I received some requests in the past to actually show you my, uh, my brewing notebook and how I set it up. So basically we go through here, we have different sections in this notebook. We have the general information section, which is pretty self-explanatory, the style, the brew batch, the date, um, you know, the, the, the IBUs and the color of the beer statistics like that you can put dates in there from like when you keg when you bottled when you brewed stuff like that then we go down to ingredients and it's just a blank canvas here so i've separated it out into grain hops yeast and water which are your ingredients in beer um and i just put on the left column the weight uh of grain that i'm using and the type of grain and then the percentage of the recipe's grain bill that is uh that particular grain takes up over here for hops same story um, except I'll put down the weight of hops, the type of hop, and the alpha acid of the hop. And, and then I'll put down the point during the boil or other part of the brew that I put the hops in there. For yeast, I just write down what the yeast is and how much of it I'm using. If I'm using a starter, if I'm doing a packet. For water, um, I'll put the actual ion over here in a column. And then the uh, concentration in parts per million here. And then next to it I say add. And that's where I put in my salts and how many grams of those I'm putting in. So below that, in brewing notes, I have mash in one column and boil in the other columns. And here I'll have our, our mash, our sparge, and then uh, our volumes and what temperatures we're trying to hit there. And uh, in, in some cases, if I'm doing something more interesting and intricate like a decoction mash or a step mash, I'll write down all the steps on this side. The boil, self-explanatory, you've seen this before, I'm sure. You're uh, 90, 60, 10, 0. Um, it's just your times and what you're doing during the boil at that time that I put over there. So add hops, add hops, add roll flock, add uh, yeast nutrients, stuff like that, and boil. On this side is mostly post-fermentation. So we have our hops and our yeast uh, notes here. I don't really know uh, a good use for those columns other than just writing them down again. Um, maybe you could write down like characters of the hops and yeast and how that affects the beer perhaps. Um, Fermentation, pretty uh, self-explanatory, those are fermentation notes. I have a really simple one, so it's just one line, but if I had something like a lager, it'd be a lot more stuff in here, or something that required a long and extensive fermentation, or if you're doing a secondary, useful to keep notes on that there. And then for hydrometer readings, I have my pre-boil, my OG, and my final gravity there. Uh, the kegging and bottling section, I typically just write down when I kegged and how much beer I got out of it. And the tasting notes are good if you remember to fill them out, <laughs> but it's split up in appearance, aroma, flavor, and mouthfeel of the beer. Um, and then this additional notes here is good for just jotting down random stuff that you think of during the brew day. Because that stuff happens, you know. Sometimes you make a quick change that you didn't account for and you 
want to write that down and see if that made a impact on your final beer because you might forget that you actually did it during the brew day. All right, so we'll go through the recipe now. So I mean, nine pounds of Maris Otter, which is a higher quality English pale malt, uh, gives you a lot more flavor than say two row or Pilsner does. It's where you get that classic biscuity flavor um, of a English beer. And just to kind of bump up the biscuit flavor a little bit more, because I personally like that, uh, we're gonna do half a pound of biscuit malt, and then we're gonna do half a pound of Crystal 120 for, um, for color primarily, uh, but that's also going to add a little bit of a backbone of sweetness and malt uh, complexity. And then we're going to do a quarter pound of special roast, um, which is basically victory malt on steroids. Um, basically, this is, this is a grain bill that's going to give us a very bready, biscuity, strong malt character. Um, and then for hops, uh, so we're going to do 0.7 ounces of Target at 60 minutes for bittering, um, and then 0.8 ounces of Fuggle at 10 minutes uh, for some added aroma and flavor, hopefully. Uh, but hopefully not too much, because we're trying to keep this rather light. So for yeast, and yeast is arguably, after the malt, probably the most important component of this particular style, we're using Y Yeast 1968 London ESB yeast. Uh, since this is a low gravity beer, I should be able to just pitch one packet of it and be just fine. Um, but you can make a starter if you wish to do so. Basically, this is a fruity English yeast that's a high flocculator. We want this beer to be crystal clear, hopefully by the end of the process. It's gonna give a really nice characteristic English flavor profile to this. It should be a little minerally and a little fruity, and on top of that really nice malty backbone, hopefully it comes out with a really nice little symphony of flavors. For water, the water is kind of important in this one as well, so we're gonna do uh, high calcium levels, high sulfate levels, um, and you want a ratio of sulfate to chloride of at least two to one. Um, this is pretty characteristic of most English ales as well. So I don't really use any sort of reverse osmosis water or anything like that. Uh, so I kind of have a lot higher concentrations of ions than most people will probably have. So just keep that in mind. So I have 110 parts per million of calcium, 24 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 255 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride, and 79 parts per million of carbonate. Um, and everyone's base water is gonna be different, so calculate what, other, what additions you need to uh, do yourself or just research your own water profile that would work for your water uh, before making this beer. So don't copy exactly what I did unless you live in my town. Um, and, but we're adding 13 grams of gypsum, eight grams of Epsom, and three grams of calcium chloride to get to uh, that water profile. Um, I'm going to mash this at about 150 degrees, kind of on the lower end of the, uh, the temperature spectrum. Uh, standard single infusion mash for 60 minutes. And uh, that's gonna get us rather high attenuation, hopefully at the end of the process. And uh, a very, a nice light bodied beer that's got high drinkability. We're gonna sparge probably with about two gallons of water. I'm using nine gallons of water right now for the mash. Uh, because I kind of do a sort of brew in the bag style. I do a full volume mash pretty much. Um, it's worked out pretty well for me in the past. We're targeting nine gallons of pre-boil volume into the kettle since I am boiling for 90 minutes. And uh, that's gonna get that color nice and burnished down to uh, a, kind of like a nice amber, hopefully. Um, we're gonna do a 90 minute boil. So at 60 minutes, we'll add our target. And at 10 minutes, we'll add our fuggle. And then we'll add some more flocking yeast in there as, or yeast nutrient in there as well. So I'm heating up all of my water right now. And uh, I've treated my water with the aforementioned salts. And I've also added a Camden tablet into my mash water because that is going to get rid of any chlorine compounds or chloramine compounds from the city water. Uh, which can ruin the flavor of a beer. So once that's all heated up, I'll catch you when we do in. All right, so we've reached the strike water's appropriate temperature, so now it is time to go ahead and do in. So I'm gonna turn off all the recirculation stuff right now, and uh, we'll get doed in. All right, so we'll start our mash now and I'm gonna go ahead and put the recirculation equipment back in after about 10 minutes or so. It's gonna give the grain bed some time to settle. I think we're gonna let this sit for about 60 minutes and so I'll see you then. All right, so we're about 10 minutes into the mash now. We're gonna do a quick pH check. Um, I don't have a fancy pH meter yet, so we're just gonna use strips for now. They work pretty fine for getting us in the ballpark. 
All right, so our pH is around the 5 to 5.5 range right now, which is good. Ideally, we want it to be about 5.2, uh, but we're going to let this sit uh, for the rest of the mash and not do anything to adjust the pH. Okay, so we're just about finished up with the mash now, so I'm going to go ahead and collect all of the, uh, the runnings we can get. So we're going to start with the first runnings, which are going to go into this kettle here, and then we'll do our second runnings, which will uh, go into what the sparge water is sitting in right now. So let me get that started now. All right, so here is our uh, pre-boiled gravity. Um, we're sitting at about 7.4 bricks, uh, which translates to about uh, 1028. All right, so we've just hit our boil, as you can see. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna sit here for uh, 30 minutes before we actually add any hops or anything, so we'll wait until then. All right, so our boil's been going for half an hour now, which means it's time to add our 60 minute hop addition here, which is this. 0.8 ounces of Target, or perhaps Target, if you're a sophisticated person. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and chuck that in right now. And uh, that's the only real hop addition we're adding until we are almost done. So we'll come back with 10 minutes left in the beer, and that's 50 minutes from now. All right, so we are now 10 minutes from the end of the boil, so I'm going to go ahead and add my final hop addition here. That's uh, just the 0.7 ounces of Fuggle. And uh, I want to correct a mistake I made earlier in the video. I said our 60 minute edition was 0.8 ounces of Target. Wait, hold on. Did I just make another mistake? Yeah, so I just made another mistake. But I'm going to correct both of those mistakes right now. Uh, I swapped the 0.7 and the 0.8 ounces. Yeah, so the Target at the beginning is supposed to be 0.7 ounces. And the Fuggles that I just chucked in are supposed to be 0.8 ounces. That is the actual weight that I weighed out earlier today. Um, I just got the two swapped in my mind and uh, made the mistake of saying that on video. All right, so the other thing we're adding at 10 minutes is this. It's a crumbled up mixture of World Flock. We're adding one tablet of World Flock to make sure this beer is clear and also two and a half teaspoons of yeast nutrient uh, to help boost our fermentation and make sure that we get this uh, as healthy of a fermentation as we can. So that's going in now. All right, so one of the other things that I'll be doing is uh, making sure that I recirculate boiling work through the chiller that I have here uh, and that's going to sanitize the inside of the chiller as well as the pump uh, and it's basically going to ensure that we can chill immediately after our boil is finished and we have sanitary equipment to do so with so I'm just going to recirculate work from the kettle pump it through the chiller and return it back into the kettle this is also going to give us a good whirlpool uh, and kind of encourage some of those uh, proteins and hop debris and stuff to coagulate in the center of the kettle so that we have clearer work coming into uh, the fermenter at the end of this process. So I'm going to set that up now. Okay, so now it's time to start chilling. Uh, so I've obviously begun. Ready to pitch now. So we are down to 65 degrees as measured by the output thermometer for the wort. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, transfer the wort from the boil kettle over into the fermenter now. So now the way that I do this, and what is probably, I think, the best way outside of uh, not having an oxygen uh, wand, really, is just to splash this into the fermenter and create a ton of bubbles. This is going to really get a good amount of oxygen and aeration in there, which you really need for the beer. Uh, even these low ABV beers really do need uh, as much as you can give them. It just 
promotes a healthy and clean fermentation. So we're gonna oxygenate by splashing and then we'll pitch our yeast once this is ready. We got like a really nice dark gold color on this, uh, this wort here. So the uh, potential color of the beer looks really good. It's uh, gonna be right on. All right, so it really does look like we're gonna probably need a blow off tube for this. We got a lot more liquid uh, than I calculated for. Um, so maybe my boil off rate got lower than I thought. I don't know, um, sometimes this happens. <laughs> anyway, obviously we're gonna have enough beer though and that's the important part. So I'm gonna go ahead now and pitch my yeast. So uh, I got a sanitized packet of uh, our London ESP yeast here. So we're gonna go ahead and pitch that right now. And that's it. All right, so fermentation for this beer should hopefully be relatively simple. Uh, we just wanna do something like 65 to 68 degrees, probably airing on the cooler side for this particular beer uh, for about two weeks. And uh, once we see a consistent and steady final gravity for three days in a row, we will be able to bottle and or keg. I keg in my case, so uh, that's what we'll do at that point. So I will uh, give you a quick original gravity clip and then uh, we're gonna time travel into the future and I'll give you a final gravity and see what happened. All right, so our original gravity sample's here and uh, we have a reading on the refractometer of about 11.2 bricks which uh, translates with correction factor um, to 1044 for an OG. So that's really pretty much what we were uh, shooting for. So that's good news. All right, so I've been fermenting this for about two straight weeks and uh, it has finally settled out at a final gravity of 1.009, which once this rotates, you'll be able to verify which is great because that means we got about 4.6% ABV. I'm gonna keg it tonight and hopefully we'll be able to serve it soon. Okay, so fermentation went very well. Uh, all things honestly went exactly as planned. We started at 65, went up to 68. Uh, final gravity was exactly where we wanted it to be and uh, there were no sorts of fermentation issues, which is great. It took about 14 days and the yeast dropped right out just completely. Uh, and it didn't even need to cold crash this, to be honest, to get it to be clean. Uh, so then I put it in the keg. It's been sitting in the keg for about a week now, and uh, it is ready to drink. It is a very tasty beer, and uh, we'll get into that more in the tasting section. But uh, before we jump into that, really quickly, I do want to make a note that I ended up carbonating this at a very low level compared to many of my other beers. And the reason for that is honestly because English beers are supposed to be consumed that way. Typically these beers are actually served off of a cask, uh, which is a big, big difference from a keg. Uh, but basically what I'm getting at is the lower level of carbonation is uh, absolutely a characteristic of this style and it tends to make a lot more of those delicate malt flavors come to the forefront. Uh, I think a lot of times higher carbonation can sometimes mask flavor in beer, uh, especially if it's a very malt forward style like this one is. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why you can get such a low ABV, but still have a lot of flavor packed into the beer. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pour this now. All right, so I called this one work from home because I think a lot of us are probably doing that right now. Uh, it came in at 4.6% ABV and uh, 27 IBUs. So for appearances of the beer, um, it's really kind of like a medium copper. Uh, I thought it was gonna be lighter than this, uh, but it's kind of like taking a bit of a, an orangish copper tone. It's completely clear, and the head on it is really just kind of like a white color. Uh, as you can see, very, very low amount of carbonation. All right, so the appearance is pretty great. It's kind of like, like I said, kind of an 
amber orange color um, with a bit of a copper tone to it. As far as aroma goes, it's really kind of quite subtle. It's um, It's got a nice toasty malt uh, character to it, kind of like a toffee type of uh, toast. Um, a little bit of earthiness from uh, from the hops that I added at 10 minutes, and a lot of also nice kind of sweet biscuit type of aroma. So for mouth feel is the next part. So as I mentioned earlier, also the mouth feel of the beer is going to be quite impacted by the carbonation levels, um, and I chose to undercarbonate this beer intentionally. Uh, which I think has actually added to its kind of lightness in mouthfeel. It's it's very drinkable. Like overall, uh, this is a beer that you can take very deep sips of and swigs of um, and not have any issues putting it away. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's not light, light, light. It's not like super light or effervescent like a Saison. Uh, so now we're going to go on to flavor. The flavor of this beer is very complex. Like it is an exceptionally tasty beer overall. Um, and I'm really, really actually surprised the amount of flavor this packs. So pretty much we're getting a lot of the same stuff we got from the aroma. Um, so mostly like a very, very prominent biscuit note. Uh, it's like a semi-sweet biscuit, um, nothing too sweet. Uh, there's a little bit of caramel backing on it, but not really that much. It's just got this really wholesome, chewy flavor that is, uh, it's incredibly malt forward and incredibly tasty. It's got a little bit of an earthy spice note from the Fuggles coming through in the hops. And uh, it adds a really nice little bit of extra character to an otherwise malty beer. I, I get a little bit of toffee uh, as well, um, but it's really quite minimal. So contrary to the name, it's not really a bitter beer, but it's definitely not really a sweet beer either. You know, these British malts pack a ton of flavor and uh, it just truly makes this a very complex and interesting beer to taste. And couple that with a light body, uh, low alcohol and carbonation levels, and this is something you could just drink all day. I think the yeast also lends a nice kind of minerally, uh, slightly fruity, but mostly minerally tinge to this, um, which kind of gave it that last little bit of, uh, of Englishness. <laughs> It's, uh, it's unlike any other beer style really out there. This is basically like a more flavorful, less hoppy, uh, more sessionable version of an American Amber Ale. Um, and it really has a lot to do with those malts. Uh, the British Pale Malts are something else. And it's a really sessionable beer. It's really solid. It's a, it's a nice spring beer, I think. You know, as you can see, I'm out on my porch now. It's like 40 degrees. So in New Hampshire, that counts as uh, springtime weather. Uh, so I'm enjoying it out here. And uh, I am stuck at home. So <laughs> it's uh, definitely a good thing to, uh, to have on tap. So overall, I'm really, really happy that I brewed this one. It's super easy to make, very cheap. Um, and honestly, you know, for a foray into a brand new set of styles, uh, this is definitely my favorite English beer I've ever tried to make before. Um, I've had uh, a couple examples of English beers by Fuller's, and that's pretty much the only like really well-known, I guess, English brewery that tends to make its way over here in the States. Uh, and honestly, this has more flavor. And I never thought I'd typically say something like that, uh, but it's a really solid beer and just, it's too easy to make. I can't find too many things wrong with this. Um, I think most, most examples call for uh, a little bit of corn sugar in the uh, boil just to kind of bring the, uh, the body down even more. But I don't think that was really necessary. Uh, it's really quite light bodied as is. So at the risk of sounding full of myself, I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10. I can't find too many things wrong with it, but I'm sure there's something wrong with it. And I, I'm very hesitant to give myself a 10 out of 10 because that just sounds like I'm blowing my own horn. Um, every beer has a potential to be improved, but this is one of the ones that I'm really struggling to find a reason on. In most cases, there's something that can always be improved. Um, and that's kind of the engineer in me talking. Um, but I really kind of am hesitant to give myself a perfect score on this since it's the first time I've ever burned it. And <laughs> there's always something that can be improved. So as far as the British and the uh, Irish and that region's uh, beers go, this is easily, easily my favorite kind. Um, 
and given how easy this was to make, yeah, you can be certain that this is gonna be popping up again. Um, very, very, very happy with how this turned out. And I think this is a good testament uh, to showing that you can actually have a really, really good uh, experience trying a brand new style or trying a brand new uh, subcategory of beers that you never brewed before. And it, it's just like, there are 99 different BJCP styles out there. So very few people I think have brewed through all of them. And uh, I know the Homebrew Challenge, another fantastic brewing channel out there is doing this very thing. And speaking from experience, I think a lot of people are very comfortable with what they know uh, and what kinds of beers are around them. But I think it's also well worth the effort to go out and just try something brand new, try a brand new style. Um, and I think there's a lot of people out there that uh, can verify that that is a good decision. Cause you never know what you're gonna discover, you know, at the end of the day. And uh, you might just find something you really, really enjoy. I know I did. I have a really important message for all you guys. This is being published early April, 2020. This is a tough time for everybody, especially for brewers and those in the service industry. So it is really, really important and I'm urging you guys to go out and please support your local breweries. Well, don't actually go out, <laughs> stay inside if you have to. But a lot of breweries are doing beer deliveries right now to your door or pick up at their brewery. And that is critical to their survival of this. This is tough economic times for a very specific set of industries and the beer industry is one of them. So please get out there and support your local brewers. A lot of them are home brewers like us and uh, started out that way. So it's just, this is their dream dying slowly. So please help them out as much as you can and try to practice the social distancing. It's not just a cool thing to say right now. It's legitimately the only thing we can do right now to help curb the spread of this, this awful virus. So please stay safe, stay healthy, and brew on. Because we're all in this together, and we're gonna get through it, okay? And at the end of the day, if this does turn into an apocalypse scenario, you as a brewer have a very marketable skill. So lately I've been trying to focus on cutting down the length of time involved in my brewing videos. I know a lot of you guys are really appreciative of the level of detail in which I go into, uh, and I think that's awesome. That gives me a lot of support, but some of these videos are, you know, greater than 30 minutes on average. And uh, if there's a more complicated technique involved, sometimes it can go more than 40 minutes. Uh, and at the risk of cutting out some of that detail, I, I wanna ask you guys what you think I might be able to improve on my editing process with, uh, if there's anything that I can do that's gonna make these videos Still have the same amount of information, uh, but cut out some unnecessary things. Just let me know what your suggestions are. I just kind of want to bring these down towards the 25 minute mark or the 20 minute mark, if, if that's possible. Uh, and still preserving the level of detail that I get into. That's kind of my niche. Um, and I think a lot of people appreciate that but I could use some suggestions at the end of the day. So that's gonna be the end of the video for me. Uh, if you guys made it here, thank you so much for supporting this channel by watching the whole video. Uh, watch time does matter. And if you do also appreciate this sort of thing on a regular basis, give it a like, give it a subscribe. I appreciate all of those things. And at the end of the day, it really makes this channel much more relevant to YouTube, uh, which means that more people can discover what I have to offer. So hopefully that is all valuable stuff and uh, I'm helping people out as much as I can. So if you wanna talk about this beer, you wanna talk about English styles, you wanna talk about your experience brewing best bitters or any other sorts of things, uh, please comment down below in the comment section. I will get back to you. I read every single comment and I try to respond to as many of them as I can in a timely fashion uh, to the best of my ability. I tend to post a new video to YouTube roughly every two weeks, uh, and that depends a lot on how much I can brew and how quickly I can empty and then fill kegs. Uh, but if you are interested in more frequent updates on what I'm doing in my brewing life, check out my Instagram down below. It's at the apartment brewer, and that is where you'll find uh, updates on the order of every couple days in terms of what I'm actually brewing in real time. Then you can see what's going to come to the YouTube channel in a little bit. Uh, Last but certainly not least, in the description box down below, I have compiled a complete recipe for this beer, and I've also got a list of all of the equipment that I use as of now uh, to brew beer with. And if you're interested in purchasing any of this stuff for yourself, I've included links to Amazon where you can buy it for yourself if you wish to. Uh, just be aware that if you do purchase something through one of those links, I do earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you, and it's a great way to help support this channel, and trust me, I do appreciate it. Thank you for watching all the way to the end, everybody. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and finish off the rest of this uh, lovely pint of beer and I will catch you in the next one. So cheers.